Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here. Happy Friday. Today we're going to be talking about Tesla's credit rating. The S&P out with a note on Tesla's credit rating after Tesla's reported earnings. We've also got updates on Tesla China and Shanghai in general, possible news relating to Tesla and Bill Gates, and a couple other items as well. All right, so looking at the stock, Tesla today down four tenths of a percent to end earnings week at $1,005.05. Of course, the NASDAQ with another challenging day today, down another two and a half percent. So for the week, that put the NASDAQ down almost four percent. Tesla outperforming, ending the week up 2%, so may not feel the best with Tesla beating earnings by 30 or 40%, but still a pretty significant outperformance. And should the NASDAQ recover, Tesla right now would be sitting in a pretty good spot to ride that wave up. We didn't really have a chance to discuss macro yesterday, but one of the reasons the market has been falling over the last couple of days are new comments by Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, these were made on Thursday, about possibly raising interest rates more quickly. He said, quote, it is appropriate in my view to be moving a little more quickly. I also think there is something to be said for front-loading any accommodation one thinks is appropriate. I would say 50 basis points will be on the table for the May meeting." End quote. With a comment like that, that should pretty quickly move to become the de facto expectation for May. As for other economic factors, always good to take a peek at the economic calendar, especially on Friday. So for next week, probably the most important report coming on Thursday, that is the advanced estimate for GDP for the first quarter. GDP actually ends up getting reported on three times. So this is the first estimate, then there will be two revisions resulting in the final estimate for GDP. All right, getting into Tesla specific news then, I wanna start with an update from S&P Global. This followed Tesla's earnings report. Of course, the S&P and Moody's are the two big credit rating agencies. So this is an update on Tesla's credit rating. The S&P in October had moved Tesla up to just below investment grade, but they're not willing to move Tesla into that category yet, even after this earnings report. They start off by saying that Tesla's first quarter results indicate solid execution and prospects for robust free cash flow in 2022 amid supply disruptions, but then they highlight some of the areas of concern. And I think these couple of sentences pretty simply encapsulate Wall Street's sort of perception of Tesla right now, even with these strong earnings. They say that, quote, we expect Tesla's factories to run below capacity for most of 2022. Production suspension, component shortages, parts inflation, and disruption to logistics will limit Tesla's expansion of sales and margins, end quote. So this is basically what we talked about on Wednesday. Even though Tesla reported really strong earnings here, there are large parts of the market that does not believe in the permanence of these results. They don't believe that Tesla can maintain these type of results. And in particular for this quarter, that is centered around margins because of all the discussion on supply chain, rising materials costs, factory ramps, and Tesla's answers around those topics. But what wasn't really talked all that much about, it was a little bit, but was Tesla's price increases. Tesla is thinking about these things ahead of time and is ready for these, but Tesla is just not the type of company to sit on an earnings call and brag about how much money they're going to be making. Sometimes they'll allude to those things and people that are listening closely understand that, but a lot of investors are going to miss that subtlety and just hear Tesla talking about all these expenses and just assume that, oh, these margins aren't sustainable. To be fair, that could very well end up being the case in the short term, especially for Q2 with the downtime that there has been in this quarter. But it would be a mistake to focus in on all of those negative things without appreciating that so far Tesla has proven its ability to be able to manage through things like that and still continue to perform tremendously despite all that turmoil. I mean, Q1 is not the first quarter that there have been challenges. The entirety of the last two years have been full of challenges. And you could have made these same arguments against Tesla in pretty much every single quarter over that period of time. But, oh, it turns out that not only were the margins at those times sustainable, but Tesla has continued to be able to grow not only the top line, but the bottom line as well. Oh, and by the way, when it comes to credit ratings, Tesla over this last year during this period of turmoil has paid down $5 billion of debt and now basically has none. In terms of cash flow, S&P goes on to say that, quote, we expect lower free cash flow in 2022 compared with $5 billion in 2021 partly due to higher capital expenditures in line with our assumptions at the time of the upgrade from October 2021, end quote. This is an extremely, extremely pessimistic view. Tesla in the first quarter posted $2.2 billion of free cash flow. That's already giving them a $1.6 billion head start on free cash flow from Q1 last year, which was $600 million, and yet the S&P is expecting this year to be worse than last year. They say for the whole year they expect free cash flow less than $5 billion, yet just in the last six months, Q4 and Q1 combined, Tesla's free cash flow in that period is over $5 billion. It's a forecast that really doesn't make any sense. They say that they expect that because of higher capital expenditures. Yet last year, in 2021, Tesla's capital expenditures were $6.5 billion. This year, they guided for between $5 and $7 billion. So unless Tesla is way, way above guidance, any increase in CapEx is going to be negligible. And so far, through the first quarter, Tesla's capital expenditures were $1,767,000,000, which annualizes to just over $7 billion. So basically right on track with guidance. For something like this to be accurate, the headwinds that Tesla faces throughout 2022 would have to be well, well in excess of anything that they talked about on the Q1 call, or any of the reasons that are extracted from that call by the S&P here, 
to justify their hesitancy. Even within their own forecast, it doesn't make any sense because they continue on to say that, quote, at this stage, Tesla appears to be in a very strong position relative to its competitors to raise its cell capacity and complete the ramp up of its production to meet demand. Specifically, we believe the electric vehicle maker is on track to increase its annual vehicle deliveries toward our forecast of roughly 1.5 million over the next 12 months, which follows its delivery of over 936,000 vehicles in 2021 and over 310,000 vehicles in the first quarter of 2022, end quote. So they're clearly projecting Tesla to continue to be able to grow deliveries, but somehow their free cash flow is going to tank, and the reason provided for that is capital expenditures, which Tesla has already given guidance for, and they just had the opportunity to update that guidance if they would have liked to. CapEx is obviously planned out pretty far in advance. Tesla's got plenty of visibility to what that number is going to be, so I don't believe the reasoning here, given by the S&P, holds up to much scrutiny. Anyway, wrapping up their note, they say that Tesla continues to benefit from strong liquidity, over $18 billion in cash and cash equivalents. And then in terms of actually making an upgrade to the credit rating, they say that, quote, we will consider upgrading the company to investment grade later in 2022 if it maintains its trajectory and sustains automotive EBITDA of over 18%, excluding regulatory credits, while ramping up production at its Berlin and Austin production facilities. Before upgrading Tesla, we would also require it to maintain a strong liquidity and generate free operating cash flow to sales of over 2%, on a sustainable basis, end quote. Those should be relatively easy targets for Tesla to hit if we look at how those numbers have come in over the last 12 months plus Q1. The X credit EBITDA margin has been running above that 18% target for the last year now, currently sits at 23% last quarter. And then I wasn't 100% certain what they meant by free operating cash flow. Usually it's operating cash flow or free cash flow. And I also don't know if they're excluding regulatory credits in that or not. So I just threw all those in this table and pretty much all of them are way, way above that 2% target. The most reasonable interpretation is probably just operating cash flow percent of sales or operating cash flow percent of sales x credits. Uh, but those were at 21 and 18% respectively last quarter, and they have consistently been that high. So yeah, 2% should be no trouble. And then the most strict interpretation of this comment would be free cash flow as a percent of sales, excluding regulatory credits. But even that well above 2% has crossed that threshold for the last year and was at 8% last quarter. So yeah, just go ahead and drag your feet longer S&P. You can cost more people more money, just like you did when you didn't let Tesla into the S&P 500 earlier. Nothing really new there. Why are we even talking about this? Well, some firms are not going to invest in a company that is not credit rated as investment grade. A lot of firms use filters like that. So when Tesla is investment grade credit rated, there should be an increase in demand for Tesla stock as it becomes investable to some of those firms. Now, I don't think that's quite as quantifiable as what it was when Tesla was included in the S&P 500. Of course, we spent a lot of time going through that. We certainly could do that again if there's information out there on it. I haven't seen much. If you have, definitely pass that along. All right, moving on, we've got a couple of updates on Tesla in China. First is a Twitter rumor. Not sure how much stock to put in this, but it does seem plausible. Market Rebelling tweeting that Tesla Shanghai official says that they produced around 600 vehicles on Tuesday and are continuing to ramp up production. Generally, Shanghai is doing about 2,200 vehicles per day, so 600 a day would be about 25% capacity, which seems pretty reasonable for the first day back and some of the constraints that we've talked about that Tesla's got right now at Giga Shanghai. About the Shanghai situation in general, the Wall Street Journal had an article about that today. They are reporting that Shanghai authorities said today that of 666 companies they had identified in key industries such as automotive and semiconductors, that would basically be prioritized to help restart production, two-thirds of those companies had resumed operations. They also reported that the deputy mayor of Shanghai said earlier this week that Shanghai and cities nearby are working to ease logistics disruptions for Tesla and other key firms. So a lot of this echoing the comments we heard from Tesla on the call. We're also starting to see some photos of Giga Shanghai come in and definitely some activity happening at the factory. All right, last item for today then. This is kind of an update on a previous story that we had had about the possibility that Bill Gates was short Tesla stock. I'm actually going to play a clip of that old episode that we had about Bill Gates, just kind of as a refresher on what happened there. But this is coming up again because yesterday on This Week in Startups, Jason Calacanis, who is a notable angel investor and also a part of the All In podcast, and of course the owner of the first Model S, had this to say. You don't accidentally I do have some inside up. information I can share. Uh, Bill Gates has a huge <laughs> short position on Tesla, uh, I found out from a friend. Like, really? Bill Gates is shorting Tesla. Wait, this is true? This is true. Bill Gates has a short position on Tesla. I've heard a large short position. The person who cares about the environment is shorting the number one person. So you can re-aggregate that. I said it. All right. So pretty clearly a rumor there and don't want to overemphasize it. And ultimately, is it really all that important to Tesla? No, but it is pretty interesting. And this topic has come up before. Some of you may remember us talking about this, but just as a refresher, I'm going to play the clip from when we talked about this previously, because it shows how Bill Gates responded to these questions and was not very convincing. 
that'll really be it for this episode. So if you're not interested in that previous discussion, you can definitely drop off here. That's totally fine. If you are, I'll play those clips here in a second. The prelude for this was that Elon Musk had said on the Joe Rogan podcast that he had heard that Bill Gates was short Tesla. All right, so here's that segment of the episode from February 2021. So that catches us up to today. And then we have Elon's claim that he heard Gates was short Tesla. Now in the last week, we've had both CNBC and Bloomberg ask Gates directly about that claim. I think Gates' tone is important in these responses, so I will play the actual clip, the first one here from Andrew Ross Sorkin, CNBC, asking Gates. So, so you're not short Tesla stock, just so we're clear. Yeah, I'm not. I, I don't talk about my investments, but I think he should be very proud of what, what he's done. Okay, so technically there he did say, yeah, I'm not, but it sounded like he was more starting a sentence of saying, yeah, I'm not going to talk about my investments, not, yeah, I'm not short Tesla, because he interrupts himself and says, I don't want to talk about my investments. So to me, that's a no comment rather than a denial. What's interesting here is his reason saying he doesn't want to talk about his investments, but in the exact same interview, he talks about his investments multiple times. He says, quote, when I invested in Impossible Foods or Beyond Meat or QuantumScape, I was doing that just to help their role in climate. Now it looks like those three will be very successful companies, and so I'll have more money to put into the tough areas of climate, like cement and steel, end quote. Okay, so he says he doesn't want to talk about his investments, but then he, in response to another question, talks about his investments in Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, QuantumScape, and then how well his investments are doing, and that he'll have more money to then go on and invest in other stuff. I mean, how much more could you talk about your investments? And he uses the first person tense here, saying, I invested. He's then asked about Bitcoin, and he says, quote, I don't own Bitcoin, I'm not short Bitcoin, so I've taken a neutral view, end quote. So for Bitcoin, perfectly fine to say I'm not short Bitcoin. Same question for Tesla. Oh, I don't want to talk about my investments that we just spent a bunch of time talking about. If you're not going to answer the question, at least come up with a better non-answer that doesn't immediately contradict yourself. He has to have known that he would be asked about that, and yet seems completely caught off guard by having to answer. So that was last week, if there was any doubt left after that, because he did start off by saying, yeah, I'm not, before interrupting himself, as we said. Here is Gates on Bloomberg yesterday, so we had five days to think about this, answering the same question from Emily Chang. Elon has in the past claimed you shorted Tesla, and I wonder if there's any truth to that. Uh, well, you know, I think Tesla's an amazing company. Uh, I wish I'd, you know, own been more on the, the, the long side, but, you know, I'm you know, it's, it's great. Uh, and, you know, I, I have lots of relatives who own Teslas that I've uh, helped buy for them. So, you know, nothing but positive thoughts about Tesla and its role. Okay, so if the answer to the CNBC question was a bit of a flub, there was a clear opportunity to just say, hey, I'm not short Tesla, I wasn't short Tesla. And again, Gates passes, and he sure doesn't look comfortable to me answering the question. My belief is that it looks pretty clear that Bill Gates was short Tesla. Who knows if he still is? I'd be surprised. But come on, how are you going to be all about climate change and then short the one company that's maybe doing more than any other company on earth to combat it? If you don't think it's a good investment, you think it's overvalued, you can just not invest in it. No one has any problem with that. But to short it, push the stock price down, make it more difficult for Tesla to raise capital, that's something else entirely. I do want to be sure to include the full context here. So Gates did have some positive things to say about Musk and about Tesla saying that Tesla's got a strong product and they've forced other car makers to look at Tesla and see if they can match it, and about climate change, saying that to solve it, we need hundreds of Elon Musks. All right, so back to present day now, not really anything to add to this, but it is interesting to hear these rumors pop up again, and maybe this will again lead to Gates being asked about it at some point. We'll have to see on that. That is really it for today and for the week, though, so as always, thank you for listening. I hope you all have a great weekend. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and we'll see you on Monday for the April 25th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.